Good morning. Uh, I occasionally speak on uh, different conferences, and usually it's uh, language agnostic, uh, technology agnostic conferences. And there, uh, people talking about F sharp, listening to F sharp talks, they considered by someone as like elitist, purists. And today I have somewhat opposite feeling that because uh, this is a pure functional programming uh, conference, and F sharp is impure, it has certain compromises. Uh, anyway, uh, we're having a lot of fun with F sharp, and I'm going to uh, talk, it, it will be some sort of retrospective talk about uh, what advantages we believe we gain uh, by switching to F sharp. Uh, and all of us are uh, like recovering uh, C sharp developers, uh, or people uh, who have been working a lot with object-oriented paradigm. My name is Vagif, and uh, I work for Norwegian consultants company Miles. Uh, and uh, the project I've been working with last uh, few years, it's a project for uh, NRK. It's a Norwegian Broadcasting Corporation, analog of uh, British uh, BBC, where uh, this is basically our product. So uh, TV, radio programs, news clips, Everything is up uploaded to, uh, to the cloud, where people can stream it on their preferred mobile and not mobile devices. And uh, this is our tool belt. Our little group is working with actual uploading of this content. So uh, our, um, we're working with so-called media distribution engine. So it has to be available all the time, around the clock. It has to be robust, it has to be efficient, uh, and this is what we ended up. Well, because you, uh, it's uh, hard to say in software world ended up. I mean, this is what we're using uh, currently. It's uh, F-sharp, we're using actor model, uh, we're using Akling, it's uh, like F-sharp idiomatic API around Akka. Some type providers, of course, some databases, uh, message queuing, a uh, little bit of uh, web API, we also use F-sharp framework for that and some uh, tests where we use a quick uh, check port called FSCheck and things like uh, TickSpec for Gherkin style tests and uh, FSUnit. Uh, so uh, sometimes there are discussions about like choice of programming language and some people uh, uh, seem to take it like personally, especially if somebody switched from language you have been using and you didn't, I mean, uh, who is wrong? And uh, uh, I witnessed some of the discussions on Hubber, and then uh, some guy uh, threw this argument, uh, like, if F-sharp is good, then why nobody uh, is willing to, uh, to learn it? And which I think it's, it's kind of a uh, meaningless argument, uh, uh, because uh, it's like to say, okay, if Schubert was a great composer, why so few people like, uh, listening to his music? Uh, well, what, what does it mean, few? And then, but this guy actually uh, posted a link to um, Stack Overflow poll, where it says that only 4% of developers only wanted to learn uh, uh, F-sharp. And then I, I checked this um, poll. Okay, it's, it's a programming language. There are hundreds of programming languages. The top 10 ends with like 7.7%. And also, it was in that discussion, it was mostly like F sharp versus C sharp, like C sharp, 8%. I mean, is, is it, does it mean anything? Uh, it could mean if it was parliament election, like with 5% barrier, then you could say, okay, 8%, you, you are in the parliament, 4% not. But it, it, it doesn't make any sense, basically. Um, and then uh, I usually not interested in such polls, but then I, I started browsing sections, and then I came to the section most paid languages. And you know what was the top one language? And look at the other languages uh, on the top. It's all functional languages. Again, it doesn't make much sense either, because probably it's like more senior people. It has something with seniority. Also, if, 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 uh, if you're living in somewhere in Kamchatka, where there are no F-sharp or Camel projects, maybe you, it will be better for you to like hunt Kamchatka crabs rather than programming F-sharp if it's just you uh, targeting being more paid. Again, it, it has very little sense. So my talk is not uh, like about this stuff. It's not about like the best programming language. It's uh, more about being pragmatic and 
making pragmatic choices in your journey. Um, uh, so uh, there was an expression like pragmatist at pain. Uh, I read it in the blog post by Eric Sink, uh, who is a, a quite famous uh, developer, became uh, interested in F Sharp, and then uh, he was referring to uh, research uh, about how products, product acceptance grow, what it goes through. Like it needs to cross some, some chasms. And then there was an important big chasm from early adopters to so-called early majority. Because early adopters sometimes is just enthusiasts. They don't need to be prax practical. They, sometimes they're not pragmatic uh, pr or pragmatic enough. But then when pragmatists who feel pain about their current choices start adopting technology or language or product, then you can say that you are <laughs> Uh, that is becoming interesting because there are real practical reasons for that. So uh, I'm going to uh, share with you some like personal reasons for switching to F Sharp, and I guess it can be shared by uh, several developers in our group. Uh, some of them I knew in forehand uh, when I was about to move to F Sharp. Something like immutable data structures, type inference. Others, I think, uh, realization of that came while I was working with the language. I will not cover things that often mentioned, some things like type providers, powerful collections, like property-based testing. I, I don't think it's like the es essence of the language. Uh, also, it, it was covered a lot, so, and, and then it's just 40 minutes talk. So I will focus on like, the, the most essential things which were uh, important for, for me, probably for our group. So, immutable data structures. And that was one of the reasons where, uh, for us actually to search for something different. Because we have first generation product where we uh, were struggling with thread synchronization, with uh, uh, locking shared state. I mean, it's typical if you have a uh, sort of enterprise product with a lot of concurrency, and then a lot of your focus will be. Uh, spent on these things. And uh, you probably have better areas to spend your, your time on, but, but you, you have to in ensure that this is properly uh, managed. And uh, uh, to illustrate how difficult, how hard it, uh, it, it can become with uh, uh, C Sharp, uh, and I guess with Java, uh, this is an example from, which I took from another talk. I wanted to come up with my example, but then uh, Somebody could say, okay, you made up some examples which fit your purpose. So let's take an example from another talk, which, which is not about F Sharp, it's just about C Sharp. It's uh, uh, Dmitry Ivanov from JetBrains. He, uh, I saw his talk at NetFest, and uh, I thank uh, him for permission to use his example. So he was showing if a uh, like not very experienced C Sharp developer is writing a, a simple class, class point, it can look like this. And, you know, in this code, it's five lines of limitation, and four of them are wrong, and two are missing. What is missing is, of course, if it's a, a reference type, you need to have get hash code, you need to have a quality. And uh, what is wrong is that uh, it, it, it's not thread safe. So you have to make X and Y read only. You have to make sure that uh, when you have a method that increase points, they're not just doing it in place. They return uh, uh, a new. Uh, object. So it's, it's kind of tragic that uh, somebody comes thinking that, okay, now I, I will be writing a uh, simple class, and he's doing it so wrong from the beginning. So I think this actually probably what uh, was uh, Vitaly in his talk, he was talking about like pr uh, theory, practice, maybe different. And then if language has s this set of default, which sort of leads developers to making wrong choices, so then people start thinking that practice is always different from theory. And uh, you can say, uh, call it design mistake, but actually, in this case, it's insufficient experience, because you have to be experienced enough to understand that, okay, you, you can't just do uh, it in a very straightforward way as you thought it would work. And these are principal differences in a um, like set of initial defaults between uh, functional programming and uh, OP. Because in, uh, sorry, uh, uh, yeah. Because in object-oriented programming, it, it's really powerful. It really empowers you. It gives you a variety of choices. But you have to be very careful. You have to be very disciplined. While in functional programming, then 
you know, it leads you sort of uh, preventing doing unconscious mistakes. So you can uh, have your focus on other things, on domain-related things. And also it gives you a uh, pass to concurrency, because we shouldn't uh, uh, underestimate the, uh, the effect of so-called Amdahl's law, uh, which, uh, which actually these figures calculate, compute, how much you waste if you have pieces of your code which can't be parallelized. And if 60% if of your code is not uh, available for parallelization, then you can throw 10 cores, 10 CPUs, and you only gain 56% uh, of uh, performance. So that's, uh, that's really uh, eye-opener for, for many. And also things like business objects, like we saw this class which, which has uh, type definitions and also some methods, and they can become very obscure, like we can, we can lose a uh, track of what's going on, and especially if we're talking about like mutable data. Um, so if you look at this, this class point, here's this increase x and increase y, and there's those avoid. Of course, here we see what happens, but very um, often we don't. So we'll come to a business object later, but uh, uh, now how we do it in, in F sharp. With F sharp we're using mostly uh, record types for these purposes, and of course, uh, you have structural equality, and you don't need to define this uh, get hash code and uh, equal method. And uh, uh, you can create, you can uh, copy uh, data and create uh, new instances of uh, points. And uh, when it comes to uh, method that would change your data, we put it in modules, and the, we use modules to scope the business uh, operations, and actually it gives you uh, also very good access to visibility. Because when I was starting with uh, object-oriented programming, I thought uh, that was sufficient. You have public, you have uh, protected, private. Well, you have a sort of public and non-public, practically. And then, if method is public, I mean, it's, it's available for, for everything. But you, what if you have point viewer and point editor? How would you solve that? And then if you, if you want uh, this increase operations to be available for everything, for every client, you just put it in a model with the same name. Uh, and then you can use it like that. If uh, you want this uh, to be put separately, so just uh, access to point doesn't give you right operation, then you put it in a different module. So you can control by modules every scenario, every business uh, scenario of your business process. So, uh, and that leads us to uh, type inference, which I believe also a uh, great uh, increase of efficiency when, and you, actually it lets you think about, uh, think differently when you design your methods. Uh, you can like, see the difference uh, in approach just, just by looking at, at the, one of the most primitive functions. So this is how you uh, get ID. There's a function that returns uh, the, uh, uh, the for every piece of data, it returns itself. And then this is method ID implement and C sharp, where you see that this T repeated three times. And that's just simplest example. I mean, what if it becomes more difficult? Uh, when I was learning F sharp, one of us, my first like, home project was to implement Convex Game of Life. Very often, like developers try this. It's it's a good uh, trial. And then uh, this is my first implementation of Convex Game of Life. It's a very set of very simple functions, which uh, every function uh, computes very simple things, like look at survives, which determines if a cell survives uh, through uh, the next generation. If cells has two or three neighbors, it will survive. Um, and then I was looking at this code. Here we are missing one function, function which is called neighbors, which gets neighbors for every cell. And I was looking at, okay, Mm -hmm. So neighbor, I have to uh, define neighbors. This is how it's defined. So here, actually, it specifies that this is a two-dimensional board. But here, there is no m mentioning of how many dimensions the board has. So what if we have three, the, what if neighbors will return three-dimensional board information? Well, it will work. No problem. So you have implementation. And, oh no, that was just my first step with F sharp. I did not deliberately try to write generic uh, implementation. It just happened to me. 
And then suddenly, this was applicable to board of any dimension. What about if it's not a board? Can it be colors? You have rainbow colors, you define neighbors, which were re red is neighbor of orange and uh, indigo is neighbor of violet. Uh, no problem. Same implementation. And of course, when you start uh, thinking, uh, applying type inference in your like, real domain, it gives you uh, like different level of thinking about details. This example from our project code, we need to send some events. Uh, so we need to have storage information, and storage is different like storage provider. Some of them access through FTP, some through HTTP. Uh, <coughs> we don't care here. And uh, we have some state. Uh, also, we don't specify what uh, state is it. And then we have this all the information, get pass, get request, some functions, and it's all bound together. And we don't need to know about particular types of this, because in this function, uh, the times are not needed. The only type which is needed really here, which is used, it's event. There it's specified. Uh, and if you look at real types, the two of them are generics, A, B, then get path becomes more different. It has job, it has uh, this type A of storage, B of state, and then it returns an option of string. The same or similar for get request. So perhaps if I was to write it in C Sharp, I wouldn't try to implement such function. I would probably inline like get send event in every possible place. Uh, because uh, I wouldn't maybe consider this code to be very, very readable. But uh, with uh, type inference in place, it, uh, it helps us focus actually on, on different level when, when extracting functions, when dividing our functions. So uh, we see clearly that it makes its way into how we write F-sharp code now. So it becomes more compact and actually uh, uh, cleaner to, to understand. And of course, when it comes to understanding and uh, uh, designing like DSL, domain-specific languages, uh, it, it's a powerful thing like algebraic, uh, algebraic data types, and of course, associated with that pattern matching. Um, in F-sharp, uh, like in most of functional languages, you have this power of algebraic data types, so you, uh, you have so-called discriminated union. Uh, so here, we are, uh, this is a classical examples of payment, where you have like bank payment, you can also ha cash, you can have uh, card payment, and then uh, you define discriminated union, which, uh, which is a choice type, choice between payment uh, card and bank account. And then you have pattern matching, where you use discriminated union. Um, and uh, of course, as long as you're, you define warnings as errors, then uh, you will have co a compilation error if you don't have all matches. I mean, nothing uh, like this uh, uh, you, can, you can do in, in C Sharp or Java, and you, can, you, you should use like, uh, interfaces or some abstract classes, but it's not, it's not as clear as uh, this. And even if you have type with an infinite number of values, like integer, you can still uh, use pattern magic on that, uh, on that through so-called active patterns. So we, we define active pattern, um, uh, which, uh, which looks like it's pattern, uh, doing pattern matching, but it just does on, on the, uh, some categ category of values, for even or odd values. And then, and then I can pattern match on them, like it was finite set. Uh, then um, business object, it uh, deserves special section in this presentation. And this is actually something that came to my uh, mind later, much later in the like, process of adopting F-sharp, because I spent so much time in OP that after switching to F-sharp, I was still doing you know, some sort of classes. I was attaching methods to, uh, uh, to data structure and thinking that that probably is the, the best way of doing it, and uh, uh, until basically I was stuck. Uh, so business object, of course, is the cornerstone of object-oriented uh, programming. It's a, it's a first-class citizens. I mean, you, you define your uh, computation, you attach your algorithms to data, and, and uh, then you have these powerful abstractions. And then you have uh, DTOs, uh, and those the uh, objects that are traveling bet uh, between your domain and external systems, uh, so they're uh, Kind of non-residents, so they don't have uh, uh, like fast uh, permanent place in your domain. They just uh, 
created uh, when, when you need them. And then it's not sufficient with DTOs, so then it came like local DTOs. It's, it's sort of limited rights resident, uh, because you see that there is an impact uh, 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 of having uh, different parts of your domain, having different structures, and then spe specifically between uh, presentation layer and, uh, uh, and, and core domain uh, backend. And then, uh, as uh, Martin Fowler put it himself, that uh, there, there is discrepancy, mismatch, and then you need to have some uh, local DTOs. And then you know it, it no longer looks looks uh, clear, looks looks clean. Because uh, what about the microservices? What about microservices having mismatch uh, between them? You also need local DTO there. So, but the the most confusing thing that it's very subjective actually to where to attach your methods. So, what was thought of like a sacred cow, like a beautiful harmony of uh, data and algorithms playing together. Uh, even when I was doing OP, uh, it looked to me more like this, uh, the picture by Ilya Repin, where you see on the front, it's, uh, it's your data. And you see how, in what harmony they are in with, with actual business, business logic. So now looking back at uh, lot of uh, like implementations uh, of, of the business business uh, object uh, it, to me it, it looks like that it's not that you can't get it right you can and of course people like Martin Fowler they are no they are very smart guys and they probably would do uh, it's very nice and clean but it's so subjective then when you have a team of developers trying to impl implement the system then very often and probably more often uh, uh, they're not. Uh, it end, uh, it, they end up with uh, with a mess. So uh, the inspiration for like doing things differently, even if for people who don't do like, functional uh, development, it's uh, Scott Flash and domain modeling uh, main functional, and I will uh, use uh, mm, the same domain for examples which I will be showing in uh, C sharp. It's order processing. Uh, you have unvalidated order and it travels through the system. You validate it. You have a, uh, a total price, uh, shipped order, cancelled order, and so on. Uh, and uh, then uh, you are a C-sharp developer. Maybe not very experienced. Or maybe, uh, maybe you are experienced. And then you start uh, making your order. And you, uh, uh, very often uh, there is an uh, idea of having unified uh, model which applicable for like for everything so you have this order which has this uh, values not um, some of properties are not used on every step uh, and then you have you start attaching methods and then okay uh, should validate be on order or not uh, or ship or cancel probably not and then you start splitting things and we have order have order manager well I guess it's better but where is business objects then? Because you see, you end up with having pure data. And you have just pure business, which, uh, which is sep uh, separate from, from the rest. Uh, what about this? Which, I mean, today, if I would go back to uh, object-oriented uh, development, I would probably start doing something like this. Uh, but, I mean, in Java C Sharp world, very often it's uh, like you have this file per class. I mean, class should be something, um, you know, uh, it should be worse to define a class. So if it's very few people actually, uh, if you look at code base uh, of like C Sharp and, and uh, Java projects, very few people doing, doing things like that. Uh, where you, and every biz stage of business processing, you, def you, you use exactly the definition of data which used there, and not, not, nothing more. So uh, with, with F Sharp, the approach to data modeling is to, uh, to create small types which, actually, which uh, express exactly what you need on every uh, processing stage. So uh, you would have different small types uh, for every step of order processing. And then you have a module where all your method, all your logic is put. Then uh, the workflow, it's readable by non-technical people, actually where you have your details, you enrich your order, you validate it, you price, then it probably gets a price attached, and you ship it, and then you, you also get uh, URL. So uh, by doing that, you uh, ensure that you uh, 
uh, you're dealing exactly with data you, that uh, you need on, on every step. And uh, that uh, leads us to uh, uh, the next section where uh, I will mention uh, like lack of nulls. Probably there is no, uh, no need to uh, talk much about this, uh, especially this uh, uh, conference, but also about options considered harmful because I think that uh, very often the message is wrong delivered to recovering object-oriented developers coming to a, a functional world. Okay, you don't have nulls, just use option, and then just replace mechanically uh, uh, nulls with options. And, uh, you know, it, of course you have to be very explicit about uh, processing options, or maybe, or either, but... Uh, 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 because with reference type, uh, uh, you can just lose track of things which can become null. With options, you, you see it. Uh, but uh, you should also avoid options wherever possible and think uh, uh, at every stage, I mean, wh why is the reason for, for having like maybe type here? Unless you, you're talking to, to external source of data where, or where, of course, optional data can come from. Uh, so, uh, <coughs> uh, the idea uh, by, uh, expressed by Jaron Minsky that you should make a legal state um, unrepresentable. It's a very important idea that should be adopted uh, by, uh, when we design our types. Uh, so uh, we should think what makes us uh, making uh, optional data in our structures and sometimes uh, if we want to cover multiple scenarios, some of them require the data, some not, then it's better to split the scenario. Sometimes we, have, we want to preserve data and send it, uh, pass it for further uh, steps. That's maybe more difficult to handle, but still we should find other way to express our purpose so the stage of execution doesn't have access to this uh, data that it doesn't need. Uh, there is a great talk, uh, quite recent talk by Rich Hickey, which is called Maybe Not, uh, at the Closure Conference. We, I, the whole talk was about like the uh, like this may be types uh, considered uh, harmful. And uh, this is a quote uh, from Rich Hickey himself, that uh, so maybe and either types, they are actually evidence of lack of first class uh, union types. And there are uh, like associated effects of introducing them. They're not associative, not, not commutative. They, you can't compose them. And uh, here this... Uh, slide where like sets versus slots so uh, and he himself uh, what what do you think the better place for for these sheeps of course it's uh, on which on the, on the left side and uh, so if you have a slot with with holes like you mentally you think that the, you have this uh, slot and every, every slot is filled but actually it is not so and it's better to operate with sets and that there is, that there is not empty spaces but it's it's a hard thing to deal with and actually the whole his talk was about like future development of closure, which would uh, treat as optional types better. So there is no clear answer on that. It's just that uh, we have to be very critical to maybe an optional types, and we're trying to do. So uh, that uh, brings us to the like end of this uh, uh, five, uh, the most important uh, reasons for for, for me personally and probably for, for our group to uh, switch to F sharp uh, and we have been doing F sharp development for like about f three years. Uh, could we make uh, our system in C sharp? Absolutely, of course. But what we see now, uh, we see clear sign of shortened uh, development cycle. I wouldn't try to give you any figure on that because that would be very you know, subjective and speculative. I don't have enough statistical data and it's just small group so I leave it maybe to to others we, but we see feedback from um, our team leads we see we have feedback from uh, development team member that it uh, uh, it's much more compact compact code uh, more than 50 percent like it's uh, it's shrinked uh, and uh, <laughs> it's uh, uh, we're expressing much more cleaner the our purposes of uh, our function functional uh, requirement when we uh, write the code. So, uh, what is uh, the source reasons for uh, uh, for efficiency? To, to to rephrase which I was what I was already saying is that, of course, we get a lot of support from algebra algebraic data types, 
uh, we use uh, the small immutable records and we define uh, the record for every stage of processing. Uh, elimination of nulls and, and also we fight against options that also makes the uh, logic uh, much more cleaner. And uh, uh, we use models to put to, to make open to control visibility of logic applied for every scenario. So we no longer have this public method that can be mistakenly called by developers who didn't understand that this should also be called on that uh, on that stage. Uh, but F# -sharp is quite pragmatic language. Actually, you you can uh, write stuff which we compiled like you wrote it in C# -sharp. There is a great talk by Don Syme himself, who is the man behind F# -sharp, F# -sharp code I love, which actually he goes through this practical aspect of Sharp uh, and when he believes it's uh, it's not it's important not to be very attached to purely idiomatic F sharp, but try to make some compromises, uh, also for the purpose of readability. And uh, related also to uh, efficient uh, programming in F sharp, there's a great uh, blog by Eric Sarpalis, where actually he's also a very practical guy in, in such respect, so he helps in his blog post for developers to like, understand what to choose. Uh, so with that, I thank you for your attention, and if you have any questions, I will be happy to answer. Four minutes. Thank you, Agif. <laughs> questions? Uh, thank you for your talk. It was pretty interesting. Uh, one thing I mm, didn't understand at all is why you say maybe option and either and uh, similar types are not composable. They were made with intention to be composed. <laughs> so I don't get it. Uh, let me... Uh yeah, it was uh, it was live from Rich Hike, uh talk, uh, and uh, I think if I understand it correctly, that uh, they're sort of viral. Uh, that once you introduce uh, this m maybe thing, then uh, you uh, uh, it sort of infects your uh, your workflow. So. Uh, it uh, it's, it sort of doesn't hide itself inside uh, when, when you advance to the next stage. You have to be explicit in dealing with that, like at every at uh, at, at every stage. That was my understanding uh, what, what, of what what was meant by that. But I it may be if you disagree, then I would refer to the the source. Uh, this is how I understand it. That it's not compatible. Any comment to that or question? A question. Next question. Uh -huh. So, thank you for your talk. And do you have any experience of introducing F# -sharp into the C# -sharp teams? Like, for example, <laughs> if we have already a pretty big project, can we start to use F# -sharp efficiently in it? Do you have any good and or bad experience with that? Mm -hmm. Uh, I heard one story by uh, one of team lead at Guardian, British newspaper, and they introduced Scala first for tests because nobody cares about how tests are written. So somebody was interested in Scala and oh, I just just try it, and then uh, and then it, it uh, uh, some other people looked at it. Oh, well, it's good, and they they brought it back to to main uh, team. So that was their way. When I uh, once mentioned that I had a conversation with, with Mark Seaman about like how to introduce F# -sharp, and then I, um, and I mentioned to him, and, and he said that uh, that according to him it's not the best way to introduce a uh, new language because in test you already consume API, which is written on, on differently. So to take full advantage of it, you have to introduce it to the core team, and then you you need you know you need support from management, you need to s support from uh, uh, some key members of the team. Um, there are some, uh, there is some 
great talk by, a, in, I think it, it's in, in Russian, by An Anton Moldovan from SB Tech, you will find, can find on YouTube, where, how they're introduced. And he came with, uh, uh, for, for the project where there is a high demand for scalability performance, so I like it, it was great C-sharp developers. And he said that like he was like pretending uh, he's doing like C sharp development, and uh, he started using like static C sharp classes with like doing things functionally, and then he sort of convinced uh, people that it's better to try it with F sharp. But again, I think they have in general the uh, quite liberal community because you know sometimes it's hard. And uh, from the time I started learning F sharp until I I could use it at daily at daytime, it took me about three years. It, it requires a like, certain number of people to, uh, to support this. And then it's back to this quote from Eric Sink, like, you have to have pragmatists at pain, because like, C-sharp and Java have too much ceremony. And uh, people need to get tired of this. Uh, they need to get, get tired of like, doing this business object thing and uh, writing so much code for, for nothing, basically. Well, for, 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 for little. So this understanding should come. One way or another. Okay. Again, thank you, Vagif. Thank you.